phú mình đau nó chịu hắn hắn rất là đau giờ hắn bị đau nhập được cái chịu khó ừ, nhưng mà nó chịu khó cái thằng khác mà đau như thế ai đi lòn thuốc mình được cái chịu khó này. không nhưng mà mấy đứa đi á nam tuổi thôi là qua nam tuổi bốn năm tuổi lẫn lớn ghê lắm bốn năm nam là lẫn thời gian nó lớn ghê đó còn ở làm chị Ni á, cả chục năm trước á Cô, cô chị Nguyễn Tủ là, là chị, chị đó, em á Đó, à. nói chung là hồi đó em biết chị là hắn, em nhớ cái Hồi đó được tuổi là 2010 là em biết chị đó ừ. Chị sinh năm 2009 Thương ơi thương, em, em cho điều hoãn lên xí thử lạnh quá thương Dạ. Yeah. 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 Qua 40 là không à, nhìn lắm. Có một cái 40 một cái năm Đã ăn từ bữa là hồi nó bà bà kêu bà máy đã dài. À, đúng rồi. Mà đi nấu tác nhanh dễ luôn á nhớ nhớ nhiều luôn á hai nói hai ngàn mười là chị nấu tóc đó á mà công nhận nấu đẹp thiệt nhanh ghê bắt hồi nó đi ra mới đi ra ăn bánh xè với ông ni hả rồi đi ăn bánh xè với ông bánh ni cái ông ni cũng chỉ làm giờ chị mình bốn mốt tuổi rồi vậy chị ơi mình mới mình mới cưới chồng đó dễ sợ mà trừ hai ngàn mười giờ trừ hai ngàn hai hai mười hai năm đầu nhanh dễ chị mười hai năm Đây. Switch ra bác.
cảm nhận ngày đi ăn đó là do uống thuốc dạ dài rồi không đau dạ dài sẽ chia sẽ bóng à không ừ, thăm hay là ra thăm thăm thì muốn thích gì bao giờ đang bị thăm à thăm thì giờ dừng thuốc vô dừng thuốc vô rồi cái câu mà á nó giàu lắm chồng chiếc ô tô vợ chiếc ô tô là biết họ giàu cỡ mua rồi giờ rồi thái cái hát luôn kê cái nến không có trong ha trong đó à của em tám chục đây mình đi làm cái việc chi cũng là cái số cái kiếp của mình đó chứ không phải là, là tự nhiên các cái việc đó mình sẽ làm được nhưng mà đổ qua việc khó mình sẽ không làm được mình thấy nhiều bích đúng rồi cái số họ phải làm với công việc đó chứ à không muốn sướng biết là tự nhiên bỏ qua cái việc nó bỏ lại thấy sướng rồi đó ừ. thấy công việc nó sướng mà ừ nó là bọn sẽ rót được cái công việc nữa Họ nghĩ số họ là số phải làm nghề làm, làm như đây với em ừ. Làm nghề đồ đó đó Thấy Từ nhỏ là đã bắt đầu làm nghề rồi ta Tôi không biết số ta tự nhiên nó làm đi chứ ta ừ. Số ta thì ta không biết Cái chạy bạc ta làm nghề thì nó không Không bị đâu Hello, welcome to BKM Car Reviews Channel. 2023 Maserati Levant Review. When we think of Maserati, we conjure up images of powerful engines and loads of personality. The 2023 Maserati Levant lays claim to both. With Ferrari source turbo engines and classic Italian design touches inside and out, the Levant is both exotic and rare. Pricing starts at $90,700.
What's not to like about an SUV that oozes tradition and sources thrust from a choice of two twin-turbo engines? Horsepower ranges from a healthy 345 horsepower to a whopping 572 horsepower, depending on the Levant model. The offered leather or silk upholstery is interrupted with wood or carbon fiber accents. Also available are upscale luxury features like adjustable pedals, an Alcantara headliner, and a 17-speaker Bowers and Wilkins audio system that further enrich the experience. To feel good about the Levant, however, you must truly appreciate the traditional Italian experience it provides because you will pay dearly for it. More expensive by thousands than the lion's share of its competitors, the Levant also struggles to retain its market value as the years pass. Does that make it a bad choice? Not if you want its exclusivity and performance. However, if it's value you seek, you may want to look elsewhere. 2023 Maserati Levant Pricing the 2023 Maserati Levant starts at $90,700. With more than 20 mid-size luxury rivals arrayed against it, the Levant is on the high end of the price spectrum. For example, the Land Rover Range Rover Sport, Mercedes-AMG GLE Coupe, and Porsche Cayenne Coupe are all thousands less. This may explain why the GT and Medina are the best-selling Levant models. Although the Maserati boosts the Medina's horsepower and beefs up its brakes, we would still stick with the GT and Pocket 10 Grand. Every Levant grade features the Q4 all-wheel drive, AWD system. You can save some serious cash and still stay with Maserati if you pick the smaller gray kale. It starts at $63,500. Here's the Levant lineup. 2023 Maserati Levant GT, $90,700. 2023 Maserati Levant Medina, $101,400. 2023 Maserati Levant Medina S, $127,600. 2023 Maserati Levant Trofeo. $167,000. These are the manufacturer's suggested retail prices, MSRP, and don't include the $1,495 factory delivery fee. Before buying a 2023 Maserati Levant, check the Kelly Blue Book fair purchase price to know what you should really pay. The Levant's resale value brings up the rear of the segment pack along with the BMW X5 and Audi Q7. What's new for 2023? Maserati put the Levant through a mid-cycle makeover in 2021. Therefore, it rolls into 2023 unchanged. As of now, the Italian carmaker has remained mostly mum regarding Levant's future. However, we have heard rumors of an electric version on the drawing board for 2025 or 2026. Driving the 2023 Maserati Levant The Maserati Levant may be part of the Stellantis family, but this is no Jeep. Its architecture is similar to the Maserati Ghibli sedan, therefore, it has real athleticism at its core. This is a well-tuned chassis complemented by either a Ferrari Source turbocharged V6 or turbocharged V8. We rate the performance among that of the best SUVs. Although we love the raucous V8 in the Medina S and Trofeo, as well as the extra V6 output in the Medina, we'd stick with the GT. Why? Because even in its entry-level guise, we think it's a blast to drive. However, if your pockets are deep and you crave more power, move on up the model range. Every step up adds to the Levant's gusto. And that chilling V8 sound? We can't get enough of it. The all-wheel drive, AWD, system has a bias to the rear wheels, but it can send up to 50% of the power to the front wheels. Off-roading isn't the Levant's specialty, 
but it can hold its own when the pavement runs out. That's thanks to an off-road mode and the standard Skyhook adaptive suspension system capable of raising the Levant's ground clearance. Italian interior. Packed with premium materials like available Zegna silk and Pianofiori leather, the Levant's cabin is luxuriously furnished. However, you may be just as pleased with the interiors of less pricey competitors. For example, the Range Rover Sport. The front seats are plenty roomy, but the back seats are a little tight. You can comfortably fit two average-sized adults in the back, but most rivals in this class are roomier. The same goes for the cargo area, which is among the more modest in the segment. Looks like a Maserati. You will instantly recognize the Levant as a Maserati. In no small measure, that's because of the liberal use of the distinctive trident emblem sprinkled around the exterior. In front, a concave grille is flanked by a handsome light signature creating an exotic look. Elegant body lines and a sloping roofline give the Levant a sporty profile. We applaud the countless options for customizing the look of the Levant. There are several wheel options, and you can even choose between five different brake caliper colors. You may also select between a traditional chrome exterior trim or the darker Durissimo appearance package. The Levant is on the larger side of the midsize luxury SUV class. Its dimensions are similar to the Audi Q8, and it's a little bigger than the Porsche Cayenne, BMW X5, and Mercedes-Benz GLE class. Our favorite features and tech. Ferrari sourced engines. The stable of twin-turbo V6 and twin-turbo V8 engines breathe life into the Levant with impressive thrust and an intoxicating exhaust note. Skyhook suspension. Tuned for performance, this adaptive suspension can not only raise and lower the Levant but minimize dive when braking, body roll in corners, and squatting when accelerating. We found it also smooths out the ride. Adaptive Matrix Headlights Automatically adjusting to various conditions, like high-speed driving and rain, these LED headlights also include high beam assist. Panoramic Sunroof A two-panel sunroof, it spans both rows of seats. Power Adjustable Pedals we were able to find the most comfortable and effective driving position with these pedals that adjust, moving closer or farther away. Bowers and Wilkins Audio System Drawing on 1,280 watts, this 17-speaker system delivers you are in the room sound. Our only complaint, cranking it up drowns out the vibrant sound of the exhaust. Standard Features Maserati loads the base GT trim with lots of standard features. In addition to the twin-turbo V6 powering it and the Medina, it gets AWD. It also provides an active air suspension with five ride heights, including an easy entry mode, sport mode, and off-road mode. It's supported by the Skyhook Performance Suspension. Also standard are a limited slip differential, a dual-pane sunroof, leather seats, heater, power-adjustable front seats, 20-inch alloy wheels, a heated steering wheel, and more. In our test driving, we really appreciated the Maserati Intelligent Assistant Infotainment System. It features an 8.4-inch screen loaded with Android Auto, Apple CarPlay, and navigation. This is very similar to the Uconnect system found in other Stellantis vehicles, which we deem one of the best infotainment interfaces in the industry. Sadly, the Levant is stingy when it comes to standard safety and driver aid technology. Among today's wide variety of popular safety tech, Maserati only provides the Levant with front and rear park assist, blind spot monitoring, and rear cross traffic alert. You must step all the way up to the Medina S to find forward collision warning and adaptive cruise control 
on the standard list. To add some additional performance, you need only move up to the Medina grade. For example, it comes with an upgraded version of the V6, making more power and torque than the GT. Other upgrades include sportier front and rear fascias, piano black exterior trim, staggered wheels, and upgraded brakes. Picking the Medina S model gains you the turbocharged V8 engine plus many more features like paddle shifters, adaptive full LED matrix headlights, and upgraded full leather upholstery. A Harman slash Cardon premium audio system, full speed adaptive cruise control, a surround view camera, automatic emergency braking, and traffic sign assist are also standard. Finally, the Levon hits its peak performance in the Trofeo model. In addition to the V8 making an extra 40 horsepower compared to the Medina S, other upgrades include a Corsa drive mode and carbon fiber interior trim, Piano Fiori leather upholstery, ventilated front seats, heated rear seats, 22-inch staggered wheels, soft closed doors, and Bowers and Wilkins premium audio system are also included. Factory options. Maserati offers many of the Medina, Medina S, and Trafio standard upgrades as options on lower trims. You may choose among many option packages and standalone options to personalize your Levant. For example, you can have Zegna silk and leather upholstery, Zegna Pelotesita leather upholstery, various appearance packages, multiple wood and carbon fiber interior trims, for zone climate control, and much more. Two twin turbo engines. Your choice of twin turbo engines delivers the Levant's go. Both engines have two different versions available. The V6 base GT model is the mildest in the lineup, but we found it still has plenty of muscle. The Medina trim is more sport oriented, using a more aggressive version of the V6 engine. The mighty turbocharged V8 explodes onto the scene with the Medina S model. It produces over 500 horsepower. If you're looking for peak performance in a Maserati SUV, you'll want the Trofeo model, which adds an extra 40 horsepower over the Medina S. Although performance is a major strength of the Levant, the trade-off is lackluster fuel economy, even from the base V6 model. Although the Levant's mileage doesn't dazzle, it's not far off the pace of its segment. Every Levant uses an 8-speed automatic transmission and the Q4 all-wheel drive system with active torque control. 3.0-liter twin-turbocharged V6 GT, 345 horsepower at 5,750 RPM, 369 lbft of torque at 1,750 to 4,750 RPM. Fuel economy, 18 miles per gallon, 16 city, 22 highway. 3.0 liter twin turbocharged V6, Medina. 424 horsepower at 5,750 RPM. 428 lbft of torque at 2,000 to 4,750 RPM. Fuel economy, 18 miles per gallon. 16 city, 22 highway. 3.8 liter twin turbocharged V8, Medina S. 523 horsepower at 6,250 RPM. 538 lbft of torque at 2,500 to 5,000 RPM. Fuel economy, 16 miles per gallon, 13 city, 20 highway. 3.8-liter twin-turbocharged V8, Trofeo. 572 horsepower at 6,250 RPM. 538 lbft of torque at 2,500 to 5,000 RPM. Fuel economy, 16 miles per gallon, 13 city, 20 highway. For year per 50,000 mile warranty. 
The 2023 Maserati Levant is protected by a 4-year per 50,000-mile warranty, including powertrain coverage, plus free roadside service. That coverage is about typical for the segment. KBB Vehicle Review and Rating Methodology Our expert ratings come from hours of both driving and number crunching to make sure that you choose the best car for you. We comprehensively experience and analyze every new SUV, car, truck, or minivan for sale in the U.S. and compare it to its competitors. When all that dust settles, we have our ratings. We require new ratings every time an all-new vehicle or a new generation of an existing vehicle comes out. Additionally, we reassess those ratings when a new generation vehicle receives a mid-cycle refresh. Basically, sprucing up a car in the middle of its product cycle, typically around the two to three years mark, with a minor facelift, often with updates to features and technology. Rather than pulling random numbers out of the air or off some meaningless checklist, KBD's editors rank a vehicle to where it belongs in its class. Before any car earns its KBB rating, it must prove itself to be better, or worse, than the other cars it's competing against as it tries to get you to spend your money buying or leasing. Our editors drive and live with a given vehicle. We ask all the right questions about the interior, the exterior, the engine and powertrain, the ride and handling, the features, the comfort, and of course, about the price. Does it serve the purpose for which it was built? Whether that purpose is commuting efficiently to and from work in the city, keeping your family safe, making you feel like you've made it to the top, or that you're on your way, or making you feel like you've finally found just the right partner for your lifestyle. We take each vehicle we test through the mundane, parking, lane changing, backing up, cargo space and loading, as well as the essential, acceleration, braking, handling, interior quiet and comfort, build quality, materials quality, reliability. Hello, welcome to BKM Car Reviews Channel. 2022 Lexus LS Overview As the flagship of the Lexus lineup, the 2022 LS sedan sets the standard of luxury and refinement for the brand, but it disappoints in a couple of important areas. The entry-level powertrain is a smooth-running twin-turbo V6, but it lacks the punchiness of a V8. The upgrade powertrain is a hybrid setup, which is insufficiently refined for a car in this lofty category. Cabin trimmings are first class, though, and the LS offers both comfort and polish for passengers. The driver may find the LS driving demeanor a bit of a snooze, but the ride is comfortable and the interior is hushed. That key rivals such as the Audi A8, the BMW 7 Series, and the Mercedes-Benz S-Class are nailing the balance between comfort, luxury, and sport only serves to highlight the LS weak points. What's new for 2022? Lexus's flagship sedan carries over essentially unchanged for 2022, but the base model can now be had with the optional Mark Levinson stereo system, and several of the car's standard driver assists have been enhanced. A unique Haku metal leaf door trim is now available on cars equipped with the luxury and executive packages. We'd stick with the standard twin turbocharged V6 engine and rear wheel drive, if only to reserve funds for optioning the LS Coolest features. We'd spring for the luxury package. It's expensive but worth it, as it adds heated and cooled front and rear seats with semi aniline leather upholstery. 28-way power-adjustable front seats with massage, rear buckets, a rear center console with touchscreen controls for climate, audio, and seat functions, four-zone automatic climate control, and power sunshades in the back. The optional adjustable air suspension, 20-inch wheels, a 360-degree camera system, real wood interior trim, 
and a wood and leather trimmed heated steering wheel are all required to add the luxury package. This pushes the LS 500's price up $17,000, but that's still cheaper than the base Mercedes-Benz S-Class. Engine, Transmission, and Performance The standard engine in the LS is a twin-turbocharged 3.4-liter V6 that delivers a silky smooth 416 horsepower. It sounds refined and powerful while under heavy throttle but hushed when cruising. A 10-speed automatic handles gear changes. Performance is more than enough for this car's luxury mission, but V8-powered variants of the BMW 7 Series and the Mercedes-Benz S-Class proved to be quicker at the test track. Models badged LS 500H feature a hybrid powertrain that uses a 3.5-liter V6 and two electric motors to make 354 horsepower. While the standard twin-turbo V6 operates smoothly, the hybrid arrangement feels unrefined and altogether not luxurious. The engine sounds raspy and coarse, and the transmission, a mashup of a continuously variable automatic transmission, CVT, and a regular four-speed automatic, steps through preset gear ratios with all the crispness of a soggy cornflake. Fuel Economy and Real-World MPG Fuel Economy estimates for the hybrid are indeed better than the non-hybrid LS 500's figures, so if you're looking to save a buck at the pump, we suppose that's the one redeeming quality of the LS 500H's powertrain. Whereas the rear-wheel drive LS 500 claims 3019 MPG Highway slash City, the rear-wheel drive LS 500H earns 3325 MPG ratings from the EPA. In our real-world testing, an all-wheel drive LS 500H managed a 30 miles per gallon result on our 200-mile highway fuel economy test. An all-wheel drive non-hybrid model managed 29 miles per gallon. For more information about the LS fuel economy, visit the EPA's website interior, comfort, and cargo, flowing lines, intricately patterned fabrics, and rich leather upholstery fills the cabin of the LS. If you really want to go all out, spec the real wood trim, artful glass inserts, and cleverly pleated door panel fabric. Passenger space is generous for four adults. Adding a fifth person in the standard three-across rear bench would deny passengers a true luxury experience, so we recommend selecting the optional bucket seats. The rear seat backs are fixed, so bulky cargo items may not easily fit in the LS. The trunk, however, for the LS 500 and hybrid model is generously sized, each holding six carry-on suitcases. Both the Audi A8 and the Genesis G90 accommodated the same amount of luggage. Infotainment and Connectivity All LS models come with Amazon Alexa, Apple CarPlay capability, navigation, and a 4G LTE Wi-Fi hotspot, all controlled through a new 12.3-inch touchscreen. That means the fussy touchpad on the center console is no longer the only way to adjust vehicle settings switch audio sources, or set a destination in the navigation menu. The system also recognizes some voice commands. That said, is it too much to ask for physical buttons for things like seat heating? Lexus apparently thinks so. In order to activate this feature, users must turn to the screen. Safety and Driver Assistance Features As with most other Lexus models, the LS comes standard with the Lexus Safety System Plus 2.5 suite of driver assistance features. A more advanced semi-autonomous driving mode feature is an option. For more information about the LS crash test results, visit the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, NHTSA, and Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, IHS, websites. Key safety features include Standard Automated Emergency Braking with Pedestrian Detection Standard Lane Departure Warning 
with lane keeping assist. Standard adaptive cruise control with lane centering assist. Warranty and maintenance coverage. Lexus offers longer powertrain coverage than BMW or Mercedes, but doesn't match up to Genesis's plan of 100,000 mile coverage. At least the first maintenance visit is provided free of charge. Limited warranty covers four years or 50,000 miles. Powertrain warranty covers six years or 70,000 miles. Complimentary maintenance is covered for one year or 10,000 miles. Hello, welcome to BKM Car Reviews Channel. Mini Clubman Review 2022 overall verdict on the Mini Clubman. There are plenty of cars on the market that are dependable and capable, but without much in the way of character. So the Mini Clubman is a welcome change. Mini Clubman Review 2022 Front Left Exterior The Mini Clubman might not be to all tastes the retro styling is potentially polarizing, but it's definitely distinctive. It's good to drive, but also practical and efficient. We'll explain all in our Mini Clubman review. The Mini Clubman is still quite clearly a Mini. Parent company BMW would not be foolish enough to mess around with the retrofied looks that are a massive part of its appeal. However, it would not be unfair to say that it looks like a stretched version of the Mini hatchback. It can't match the visual charm of the regular Mini then but it's still an interesting looking thing whether they are practical or not is another matter, but the vertical opening rear doors that hinge from the sides of the car are eye-catching touch and a nod to the original Mini Clubman of the 1960s. Inside, the Mini Clubman has plenty of familiar touches too, such as the circular speedometer and infotainment display, toggle switches and chunky detailing. It's also built to a high standard in here, as you'd hope, given the premium price. But there is a feel-good factor that comes from the mix of interesting design and quality feel. In terms of physical space, the Mini Clubman's interior is quite impressive. There's enough room for adults in both rows. While the boot is competitive with other family cars, if not other estates. The driving experience is very much in keeping with the Mini brand. The Mini Clubman is a pleasurable car to drive. It has comfortable suspension, as long as you stick to sensible wheel options, and is fun through the corners too. Refinement is also impressive, and the Mini Clubman can cruise as comfortably as it can scoot along a country road. There's a broad engine range too, up to and including the very powerful JZW performance model, but the more sensible options offer a good mix of refinement, performance, and economy. If you like the way minis look, then the Clubman could be the perfect solution to your need for more space. It's a nice car to drive and to live with, and although it is ultimately not quite as practical as the best cars in the class, it also offers something many of them don't namely a strong style statement and a big personality. There's no need for the flying wing badge inside the Mini. Sit in the driver's seat and you will instantly know where you are. It's one of the most stylized interiors in the market whether it's stylish or not is a matter of personal opinion and makes a pleasant change from the fine but dull cabins you tend to find in Mini rivals. Mini Clubman Review 2022 Front Interior It's not all style over substance either, as the Mini Clubman's dashboard is quite sensibly laid out. The big central speedometer is mirrored in the circular central infotainment screen, and the rotary controller down low by the gear lever is easy to use, with the backup of steering wheel controls and voice control for many functions. The toggle switches are an attractive design feature too, although they are placed quite low down on the dashboard which can make them hard to find when on the move. All occupants should find it easy to get comfortable. The driver's seat has height adjustment as standard, and a handy feature is that the instrument display moves in tandem with the steering column, 
so you'll have a clear view regardless of your driving position. The seats themselves are comfortable, although many persist in using a lever to adjust the seat back rather than a rotary knob which allows finer adjustment. One slightly negative aspect of the Mini Clubman's bold design is that the windows are relatively narrow, so visibility is not as good as you might expect from a car of this size and the rear doors leave a pillar in the center of field of view. Handling and ride quality. What is the Mini Clubman like to drive? From the very beginning of the reborn version, the Mini has had a reputation for being good to drive. And although the Clubman doesn't quite match up to the go-kart with stripes ideal, it's still one of the better cars to drive in the class. Mini Clubman Review 2022 Front Left Exterior Perhaps more importantly, the Mini Clubman offers a good level of ride quality, as long as you choose the right specification. On the standard wheels and suspension, it deals well with road imperfections most of the time, only sharper imperfections make their presence felt. If you choose the sport trim with the Mini Clubman, you get stiffer suspension, but can be deselect, and larger wheels which trade comfort for sharper handling more grip in corners, and sportier looks. There is also the option of 700 pounds adaptive suspension, which let you choose between a comfy ride or neater handling. Unlike a lot of modern cars, the Mini Clubman steering is quite weighty. It gives the driver confidence, and the fact that it is not over-assistant helps you judge how much grip the car has in bins. Even the basic classic model with the smallest wheels is happy to scoot around country roads at speed. MPG and fuel costs. What does a Mini Clubman cost to run? The Mini Clubman benefits from a range of modern and efficient engines, so it can be quite economical despite its sporty looks. The 1.5-liter three-cylinder petrol is the best of the bunch with a claimed maximum combined fuel consumption figure of 44.1 miles per gallon under the tougher WLTP rules, you should get close to 40 miles per gallon. Mini Clubman Review 2022 Left Exterior The more powerful 2.0-liter turbocharged unit isn't far behind with a claimed figure of 42.2 miles per gallon, but you can expect that to drop below 40 miles per gallon in regular use. The Cooper D model offers a claim 65.7 miles per gallon under the older NDC rules, but you should still see 50 miles per gallon and more without too much effort. How much should you be paying for a used Mini Clubman? Although it has only been on sale for a few years, Minis of all varieties are popular cars, and as it is still on sale you should find a good choice of new, pre-registered and used examples. Mini Clubman Review 2022 Boot Space A quick search of the Haycar Classifieds brought up plenty of very new examples with low mileages. We found a 2020 Cooper 1.5 with a NAV Plus pack and delivery mileage for £20,945. As for older examples, the earliest 2016 models are now approaching the £10,000 mark if you look hard enough. We found a 2016 Cooper D model with under 70,000 miles on the clock for 9,500 pounds, or a 1.5 liter Cooper from the same year with less than 40,000 miles for just over 10,000 pounds. Hello, welcome to BKM Car Reviews Channel. Chevrolet Silverado 1500. 2022 Chevrolet Silverado Review far more competitive than before. The Chevrolet Silverado was fine until it wasn't. Rival full-size trucks got major makeovers with whiz-bang features and sharp new tech, leaving the outgoing generation to feel fairly low rent by comparison. But the 2022 Silverado brings big bow ties, half-ton offering back into the fray with some unique tricks up its sleeve and one hell of an overall glow-up. From a distance, the new Silverado might not look all that new. A little nip-tuck in the front fascia is all the Silverado needed, 
since exterior aesthetics was hardly the reason anyone was talking trash in the first place. My high country tester's grill looks a little air conditioner why, but it's pretty sharp overall. The $445 Multiflex tailgate adds a whole bunch of versatility to the bed, while $1,495 retractable side steps make getting in and out easier for shorter folks, and they tuck up against the body nicely when not in use. The single greatest point of improvement on the 2022 Silverado, though, can be found upon opening the door. LT trims and up get a brand spanking new interior that borrows a lot from GM's full-size SUVs, and it's so much better than before. The plastic fantastic vibe is largely gone. There's more soft-touch material in its place, and the dashes of wood around the cabin look and feel premium. There are still some familiar switches in familiar places, but for long-time truck owners, a little continuity between generations goes a long way. Since pickups are equal parts work and family machines these days, it shouldn't come as a surprise that the Silverado offers some solid daily practicality. The door pockets are huge, and the center console has three separate trays for storing whatever comes to mind. The cubby under the armrest is positively cavernous, too, and I enjoy the extra cubby hiding behind the infotainment display. If you want to throw a bunch of junk in the second row, the seats fold up for a little extra space. When hauling humans instead of buckets, second row storage is nearly as plentiful as what's up front. Every Silverado with a new interior also gets a major tech boost. The new digs come standard with a 13.4-inch widescreen infotainment display running the latest version of the Chevrolet Infotainment 3 software. A dock along the left side offers quick swaps between pages, but there's a split-screen setup that better utilizes all that real estate. Wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto are standard, but the coolest part is a bunch of new Google integration including a voice assistant and Google Maps, the latter of which lets me log into my Google account so I can bring searches from my phone or desktop right to the car. My high country tester also includes a flashy new 12.3-inch digital gauge display. There are four different configurations on offer, in addition to segments of the screen that can display all sorts of vehicle information. The only bummer is that you can't put Google Maps in there. When navigation is running, the gauge cluster only shows the next turn and the distance to it. The $1,870 technology package adds a full-color head-up display that brings relevant information even closer to my line. When it comes time to charge, the front row can access two USB-A and two USB-C ports in addition to a 110 volt outlet, while rear passengers get one USB-A and one USB-C. While most of that stuff is impressive, it's not exactly unique to GM or the 2022 Silverado. But you know what is? Super Cruise. And while you have to shell out $60,000 or more to access it on the high country model, in addition to paying $2,200 for the system itself, it's worth it. It's cool and composed in a way that Ford's Blue Cruise or Tesla's Autopilot is not, and it's damn easy to figure out what the system is trying to convey, thanks to very obvious icons in the HUD and gauge cluster, in addition to that slick LED array in the steering wheel. Just get the truck up to speed on the highway, Hit the Super Cruise button, wait for the lights to turn green and Bob's your uncle. When Super Cruise is active, just keep your eyes on the road and the Silverado will handle the rest. The latest iteration of this software does a great job holding this large mass of metal in the center of its lane. Its newest parlor trick is automatic lane changes, which can be started manually by tapping the turn signal stock. But Super Cruise is also capable of determining when to change lanes on its own. 
The movements are generally quick and drama-free. My favorite part is that Super Cruise won't hang in the left lane if it's avoidable. If the system detects an open lane to the right, it'll keep itself from being the guy and holding up faster traffic. In that sense, it's better than most human drivers. Even if you don't opt for Super Cruise, the 2022 Silverado is still pretty well loaded with safety systems. All trims get automatic emergency braking, blind spot monitoring, lane departure warning, and lane keeping assist. The aforementioned technology package adds adaptive cruise control, and while parking sensors are also part of the equation, they arrive disabled on my tester because of supply chain issues. Although the Windows sticker includes a $50 credit for a later retrofit when parts are available. Otherwise, the 2022 Chevy Silverado is a regular old pickup truck. Buyers can opt for a diesel inline 6, a turbocharged inline 4 or two different V8s. And my tester comes toting the top tier 6.2 liter V8, which makes a sufficiently potent 420 horsepower and 460 pound-feet of torque. It's not exactly thrifty, coming in at an EPA-estimated 15 miles per gallon city and 20 miles per gallon highway, numbers I find easy to meet but not the easiest to beat. Nevertheless, all that um permits a max tow rating of 13,300 pounds, ahead of the Ram 1500 but just below the Ford F-150. The 10-speed automatic transmission is a smooth shifter up and down, but overeager low-speed throttle sensitivity makes smooth starts more difficult than I'd like. The Silverado's ride quality is predictably truckish, shuffling around like a big bowl of jello on Kirby Forest backroads. My tester's $900 adaptive suspension does a good job eating up most road inconsistencies leading to a ride that's generally chill, even with an unladen bed. There's a sport mode baked into the Silverado, but I have no idea why anyone would activate it. It just makes everything feel jumpy. The 2022 Chevy Silverado is not a cheap proposition. Regular cab models start at $36,395 but that limits you to the work truck trim that lacks the new interior. Crew cab variants start at $42,095 for the WT with rear wheel drive. Stepping into that new interior requires about $50,000 at the minimum, with my fancy high country tester starting at $60,300. My tester's options list includes $2,495 for the 6.2 liter V8, $2,425 for a moonroof and fancier wheels, and all the upgrades I mentioned earlier. All in, the Windows sticker rises to a staggering $72,870. There's also the matter of electrification. The Silverado EV still only exists as a $100,000 kit out moonshot while the Ford F-150 Lightning is reaching customers as we speak, and it can be had for as little as $53,000 in its XLT trim with a standard range battery. The F-150 also comes in a gas-electric hybrid variant, and while the Ram 1500 only offers mild hybrid electrification, at least it's something. But if you're not quite ready to bring batteries into the equation, the 2022 Chevy Silverado is quite the compelling package, with the right amount of killer tech and an interior that's so much better than anything that came before. Hello, welcome to BKM Car Reviews Channel. 2022 Volkswagen Atlas The 2022 Volkswagen Atlas is a mid-sized three-row crossover SUV and is the largest model currently available in VW's lineup. The Tennessee-built Atlas offers plenty of space, a nice balance of ride comfort and road feel, and easy-to-use tech features. Volkswagen has updated the Atlas a handful of times since its debut in 2018 with revised styling, 
additional features and new tech. For 2022, the Atlas drops its base trim level, as well as adding more standard features to the remaining trims. The three-row midsize SUV class is crowded and competitive. Some of Edmund's favorites include the Kia Telluride, Hyundai Palisade, Honda Pilot, and Mazda CX-5. You could also look at the stylish Atlas Cross Sport if you like the Atlas, but don't need the third row. But overall, there's a lot here to like. Check out our test team's expert rating to learn more about the Atlas hits and misses. What's it like to live with? Our test team evaluated a Volkswagen Atlas over the course of a year and more than 20,000 miles. You can read about everything they liked and didn't like in Edmunds VW Atlas long-term road test review. Note that while we tested a 2018 model, the 2022 Atlas is of the same generation and most of our observations still apply. How does the Atlas drive? Neither Atlas engine is all that great. The optional V6 engine delivers decent acceleration off the line, but runs out of oomph when the Atlas is merging at speed, even with an empty cabin. Our V6 equipped Atlas test vehicle needed 8.5 seconds to cover 0 to 60 miles per hour, which is slower than many rival three-row SUVs. We also tested the base four-cylinder. Surprisingly, that Atlas was quicker, with 0 to 60 miles per hour coming up in 8.1 seconds. Otherwise, the Atlas is pleasant to wheel around considering its size. It's composed and stable when going around turns, and the smooth brakes and transmission shifting make this an easy SUV to drive every day. Comfort 8.0-10 How comfortable is the Atlas? The Atlas front seats lack some adjustability, and the bottom cushions feel a little flat and long, which might be uncomfortable for short drivers. Both back rows recline, and the second row slides, and has a slightly firmer middle seat. The Atlas has a settled ride quality. The suspension absorbs most bumps, and road undulations without getting overly floaty. There's some road noise, and the large mirrors generate noticeable wind noise at highway speeds, but it's nothing the audio system can't conceal. The Atlas climate system is strong and has plenty of heating and cooling capacity. How's the interior? There's plenty of room in all directions up front, and the second row is wide enough for three adults across. Also, the third row fits adults six feet or shorter with surprisingly little effect on comfort. The Atlas also gets high marks for its clever sliding second row seat with good rear visibility to boot. It does take some time to become familiar with the Atlas available digital gauge cluster, but once you're accustomed to it, functionality is wide ranging. One downside to the touchscreen infotainment system interface is having to look at what you're pressing, which takes attention away from driving. How's the tech? The Atlas boasts a strong assortment of technology features. The infotainment system includes Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone capability. The base stereo has pretty good quality and the optional 12 speaker system on top models boasts impressive sound quality. Voice control is improved over previous versions of the Atlas, but remains restricted to pretty basic commands. A number of driver aids also come standard, and adaptive cruise control handles transitions and maintains gaps well for such a large vehicle. We also like the subtle lane keeping assist. The rearview camera is crisp and provides several viewing options. How's the storage? The Atlas dominates the midsize SUV competition with 20.6 cubic feet of space behind the third row and a maximum capacity of 96.8 cubic feet. The flexibility of the manual folding flat seats is great, and our test SUV also had a hands-free tailgate. 
The Atlas offers a good amount of storage space for small items, but there are no obvious storage cubbies for items such as sunglasses or section compartments in the center armrest bin. The second row packs plenty of space, and there shouldn't be any issues fitting a rear-facing car seat there. The second row is also designed to tilt and slide with a seat installed. How's the fuel economy? The four-cylinder engine is less thirsty than the optional V6. The EPA estimate is 22 miles per gallon combined, 20 city slash 24 highway with all-wheel drive. On our 115-mile evaluation route, our AWD-equipped test atlas averaged 23.5 miles per gallon, indicating the rating is accurate. But that still trails some 3 row V6 equipped rivals such as the Honda Pilot and Toyota Highlander. Is the Atlas a good value? The Atlas comes in a little pricier than most of its competition at its top trim levels. It balances that by offering plenty of safety and technology features that are effective and easy to use. What doesn't feel worth the price is the lack of horsepower plus an abundance of hard plastic in the second and third rows. That could be okay, though, if there's a high likelihood of kids sitting in back. Volkswagen once offered great warranty coverage, but has fallen behind recently. Kia and Hyundai offer the best basic warranties by far, and many other crossovers beat the Atlas in powertrain coverage. The Atlas isn't as fun to drive, as a Mazda CX-9 or Honda Pilot, but buyers who don't need sporty abilities will find the Atlas pleasant enough. Our editors have mixed opinions about the Atlas styling. Some think it looks handsome, especially with the available R-line enhancements, while others say it doesn't do enough to resemble other models in the VW lineup. Which Atlas does Edmunds recommend? Go with the SE with technology trim for the best value. Although it doesn't come with all of the Atlas available advanced driving aids, it otherwise is well equipped for a three-row family hauler. It's also the least expensive way to get the optional V6 engine, which is more satisfying than the base four-cylinder. Volkswagen Atlas Models The 2022 Volkswagen Atlas is available in six trim levels. SE, SE with technology, SEL, SEL R-Line, SEL R-Line Black and SEL Premium R-Line. The SE, SE with technology and SEL trims come standard with a turbocharged 2.0 liter four-cylinder engine, 235 horsepower, 258 lbf key, a 3.6 liter V6 engine, 276 horsepower, 266 lbft. Engine is available on the SE with technology and all the SEL permutations. Feature highlights include Hello, welcome to BKM Car Reviews Channel. 2022 Hyundai Sonata Consumer Reviews. Trending Topics and Reviews. When it comes to a daily driver, I have several parameters. I won't spend over 40 G. I won't lease. And at 6 feet 2 with nerve damaged legs from my battle with cancer, legroom and seat comfort are paramount. Comfort is also an extremely subjective category. What works for you might not work for me, and vice versa. Accord sport slash touring seats don't work for me. Camry and TRD trim is too fast and furious for me. Altima has a CVT trans and horribly uncomfortable driver's seat for me. I was considering a K5 GT, but none to be found locally. Figured I'd drive a Sonata in line to get a feel for the package and scratch it off my list. I was not a huge fan of the 2020 exterior redesign although it slowly grew on me. And it does look better in inline trim. I had a few cars on my list to spend a few days looking at and driving. The inline was the closest so I started there. Sat in it for a bit 
and the driver's seat worked for me. Salesman threw a tag on it and told me to go have fun. Within a mile, I was impressed. Twenty minutes later, when I returned, I told the salesman to make me an offer I couldn't refuse. I drive it home ninety minutes later. The ride is firm, but not harsh. It's definitely quieter than the previous generation Sonata. Handles great. Faster than a Hyundai should be allowed to be. The dual clutch transmission is fantastic. I've owned two dozen or so cars over the years, several German. I've never been approached about any of them the way I've been with this car. Seven weeks with it as I write this, and I've been approached by strangers nearly two dozen times. Some knowing what the end line is. Some asking if it's a Genesis or an Audi. Some genuinely not knowing what it could be. Gripes? Wish it had memory settings for the driver's seat. Wish it had ventilated seats, although so far I really don't miss them. The light sensor for the auto headlights is beyond sensitive. I can barely clear going under an average overpass at highway speeds without the lights coming on in barely two seconds. Honestly, that's it. I don't regret my decision, and I look forward to driving it every day. Update April 23, 2022. Just over 20,000 miles in. Thermostat was replaced back in January. It was stuck open so it wasn't really getting much heat. Other than that, routine oil changes, engine and cabin air filters, and replace the tires only due to personal preference. I wasn't a fan of the Pirellis. A couple of 500 mile days with road trips. Still get asked what kind of car it it frequently. Fit and finish still like new. Was this review helpful? I researched my cars for a year or so before buying and was particularly interested in the Sonata N-Line and the Kia K5 GT, both built on the same platform and mechanically identical. The Kia GT has a lower MSRP, but all the cars I found for sale came with a $4,000 GT1 package, which jumps the MSRP up over $35,000 compared to $33K for the Sonata N-Line that includes all the GT1 features in the MSRP. Those 12 Bose speakers are very nice. The question is this a family sedan or a muscle car? My answer is that it's family sedan with teeth. The first impression of the car, riding high on the 19-inch tires, is that it's big. My previous car was a 2017 Sonata Eco, and when I told my wife that the inline was identical in length and width, she said, No way! This is a much bigger car! It was only when she saw that it fit into the same space in the garage as my 2017 that she believed the dimensions were the same. I've owned some muscle cars in the past, and most of them made you drive them hard. They just weren't that smooth at low speeds. The inline is not that way at all. Drive it with a light touch, and you'll get 28 mpg combined and it's just as smooth and elegant as can be. But when you want the power, it's there. This car won't ever be described as tossable, but you can take it into a curve fast, and it will hold the line. I frankly don't plan to try to beat others off the line all that often, as the car burns rubber easily, and I plan to hold onto to those expensive 19 inches for a while. But the temptation can be hard to resist. Yesterday a guy with a tricked out Mercedes came up beside me at a light and started gunning his engine. I didn't bother switching to sport mode and started off the line lightly to avoid burning rubber. He got out a little ahead, but I blew him away easily. Get the end line up to 1650 RPM gently, and then step on it, and it will fly. The Mercedes chased me around for a while trying to do it again, and I just ignored him. Guess he just couldn't believe his hot car was clobbered by a Hyundai. 
but where the inline is particular impressive is in mid-range acceleration. It goes from 60 to 100 so quickly, quietly, and smoothly that you almost don't believe it's that fast. I really like the sleeper aspect of the car. I like to use the power just occasionally, like when you're cruising down an on-ramp to the interstate with a nice fat space waiting for you, and some jerk decides to speed up and cut you off. Or when someone is doing 55 in the fast lane in a 70 miles per hour zone and you need to go around. Or just pulling out and passing on a one lane highway. The inline gets the job done easily and smoothly. Look at the cars with equivalent horsepower, DCT, brakes, suspension, safety features and amenities and you'll find most of them run $20 to $30,000 more. If you need baby butt leather and wood paneling, you'll have to buy the more expensive car. The M-Line, despite nice seats and red stitching, looks like a Hyundai inside. But the exterior is beautiful and the features are awesome. It's the right car for someone like me who wants the power and comfort but doesn't believe in paying $20,000 for the hood ornament. Hello, welcome to TB Car Reviews Channel. 2022 Hyundai Sonata Consumer Reviews Trending Topics and Reviews When it comes to a daily driver, I have several parameters. I won't spend over 40 G. I won't lease. And at 6 feet 2 with nerve damaged legs from my battle with cancer, Legroom and seat comfort are paramount. Comfort is also an extremely subjective category. What works for you might not work for me, and vice versa. Accord Sport slash Turing seats don't work for me. Camry and TRD trim is too. Fast and furious. For me. Altima has a CVT trans and horribly uncomfortable driver's seat for me. I was considering a K5 GT, but none to be found locally. Figured I'd drive a Sonata in line to get a feel for the package and scratch it off my list. I was not a huge fan of the 2020 exterior redesign, although it slowly grew on me. And it does look better in inline trim. I had a few cars on my list to spend a few days looking at and driving. The inline was the closest so I started there. Sat in it for a bit and the driver's seat worked for me. Salesman threw a tag on it and told me to go have fun. Within a mile I was impressed. 20 minutes later when I returned, I told the salesman to make me an offer I couldn't refuse. I drive it home 90 minutes later. The ride is firm but not harsh. It's definitely quieter than the previous generation Sonata. Handles great. Faster than a Hyundai should be allowed to be. The dual clutch transmission is fantastic. I've owned two dozen or so cars over the years, several German. I've never been approached about any of them the way I've been with this car. Seven weeks with it as I write this, and I've been approached by strangers nearly two dozen times. Some knowing what the end line is. Some asking if it's a Genesis or an Audi. Some genuinely not knowing what it could be. Gripes? Wish it had memory settings for the driver's seat. Wish it had ventilated seats, although so far I really don't miss them. The light sensor for the auto headlights is beyond sensitive. I can barely clear going under an average overpass at highway speeds without the lights coming on in barely two seconds. Honestly, that's it. I don't regret my decision, and I look forward to driving it every day. Update April 23, 2022. Just over 20,000 miles in. Thermostat was replaced back in January. It was stuck open so it wasn't really getting much heat. Other than that, routine oil changes, engine and cabin air filters, and replace the tires only due to personal preference. I wasn't a fan of the Pirellis. A couple of 500 mile days with road trips. 
still get asked what kind of car it is frequently. Fit and finish still like new. Was this review helpful? I researched my cars for a year or so before buying and was particularly interested in the Sonata N-Line and the Kia K5 GT, both built on the same platform and mechanically identical. The Kia GT has a lower MSRP, but all the cars I found for sale came with a $4,000 GT1 package which jumps the MSRP up over $35,000 compared to $33K for the Sonata N-Line that includes all the GT1 features in the MSRP. Those 12 Bose speakers are very nice. The question, is this a family sedan or a muscle car? My answer is that it's family sedan with teeth. The first impression of the car, riding high on the 19-inch tires, is that it's big. My previous car was a 2017 Sonata Eco, and when I told my wife that the inline was identical in length and width, she said, No way! This is a much bigger car! It was only when she saw that it fit into the same space in the garage as my 2017 that she believed the dimensions were the same. I've owned some muscle cars in the past, and most of them made you drive them hard. They just weren't that smooth at low speeds. The inline is not that way at all. Drive it with a light touch, and you'll get 28 mpg combined, and it's just as smooth and elegant as can be. But when you want the power, it's there. This car won't ever be described as tossable, but you can take it into a curve fast, and it will hold the line. I frankly don't plan to try to beat others off the line all that often, as the car burns rubber easily, and I plan to hold on to those expensive 19 inches for a while. But the temptation can be hard to resist. Yesterday a guy with a tricked out Mercedes came up beside me at a light and started gunning his engine. I didn't bother switching to sport mode and started off the line lightly to avoid burning rubber. He got out a little ahead, but I blew him away easily. Get the end line up to 1650 RPM gently, and then step on it, and it will fly. The Mercedes chased me around for a while trying to do it again, and I just ignored him. Guess he just couldn't believe his hot car was clobbered by a Hyundai. But where the end line is particular impressive is in mid-range acceleration. It goes from 60 to 100 so quickly, quietly, and smoothly that you almost don't believe it's that fast. I really like the sleeper aspect of the car. I like to use the power just occasionally, like when you're cruising down an on-ramp to the interstate with a nice fat space waiting for you, and some jerk decides to speed up and cut you off. Or when someone is doing 55 in the fast lane in a 70 miles per hour zone and you need to go around or just pulling out and passing on a one lane highway. The inline gets the job done easily and smoothly. Look at the cars with equivalent horsepower, DCT, brakes, suspension, safety features and amenities and you'll find most of them run $20 to $30,000 more. If you need baby butt leather, and wood paneling, you'll have to buy the more expensive car. The M-Line, despite nice seats and red stitching, looks like a Hyundai inside. But the exterior is beautiful, and the features are awesome. It's the right car for someone like me who wants the power and comfort, but doesn't believe in paying $20,000 for the hood ornament.